Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to, to all, all of our friends who have joined for this webinar. I'm starting. Um, uh, very excited to start this topic today uh, for the webinar. This is a rapid discovery. How can we accelerate the drug discovery from hit ID to clinic um, as a collaborative effort between Syngene and um, Accelate? Uh, the, the session is uh, today our speakers are uh, Takaharu Hirayama from uh, Exilid, uh, Tomohiro uh, Kawamoto from Exilid, and myself. My name is Atul Tiwari um, from uh, Stinjin. So um, essentially what we are going to cover today is um, how two organizations, Exilid and Stinjin, uh, in this particular space of the drug discovery, they are collaborating with each other. Uh, in the different areas of the preclinical research, starting from the target research, uh, identification, validation, to hit identification, the lead generation and optimization, and the preclinical candidate selection and the nominations. Uh, we are going to discuss a lot of the some important tools, technologies, platforms, uh, which are very important at the different stages of the project uh, in, the, in the coming talk. Uh, what actually it is going to talk, how they are with, how they are supporting the early part of the research and how Syngen is translating the, the hit, hits to the clinical candidates. This is our seamless solution, which is making a big difference in expediting the, the drug discovery process. So like I mentioned, we are going to start with our today's discussion. Um, uh, Kazu Yoshi, uh, so he is the head of the Customer Innovation Accelerator at Exilid. Uh, uh, Kazu is going to introduce Exilid briefly, uh, following with uh, Tomohiro uh, Kawamoto, who is the Senior Director for the Discovery Biology at Exilid. Uh, he is going to talk about the high throughput screening and approaches for the efficient hit identification. Uh, Takaharu Hirayama uh, is Senior Director for Chemistry at Exilid. Um, and uh, he is going to talk about the post HDS data analysis and interpretations. And lastly, uh, it will be me, like uh, my name is Atul Tiwari. I'm, I'm heading the discovery service solutions at Syngene, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about Syngene, what kind of a uh, what Syngene is, and then following that, I'm going to discuss about the collaborative and integrated model at Syngene, which can expedite your research. Um, and last but not the least, we have uh, Sachin Mangle, who is uh, from Syngene. He is going to be webinar moderator. And all the question and answers uh, will be will be gathered by Sachin, and he is going to direct us at the end of the session. So, with that, I welcome all the speakers, all the participants for this webinar, and I hand it over to Kazu to start his presentation. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for coming to Xinjiang and Axelid uh, collaboration seminar today. Uh, I'm Kazu Aso, here, head of uh, Customer Innovation Accelerator from Axelid. Uh, in this presentation, I'm talk about the company overview of Axelid Drug Discovery Partners. Uh, that is a fast and unique solution provider for drug discovery research in Japan. <clears throat> uh, we are a solution provider in drug discovery research. Uh, what is a solution provider? Uh, that means Axelid is different from a traditional CRO as a technology provider. Uh, we provide solutions against customers' issues in their drug discovery research based on our knowledge, experience, and data. Actually, the drug discovery partners uh, established, on, uh, established in 2017 as a Takeda spin off company and fully independent on uh, 2019. Our last July marked fifth anniversary of founded of our company. <clears throat> now, there are about 270 uh, employees. We are uh, located in Shonan Health Innovation Park. That is the uh, largest uh, science park in Japan. Uh, we have already contracted uh, more than 200 organizations, including uh, US Big Pharma, uh, and most of Japanese pharma, and the ventures in the US and Japan, as well as academia. <clears throat> Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, our uniqueness and the differentiation points from a traditional CRO. Currently, there are 250 scientists who have professional 
uh, expertise in drug discovery field and our outstanding track record, uh, such as 100 INDs and 20 NDAs. We also have market leading uh, uh, platform infrastructure. We have inherited Takeda's preclinical R&D capability, including its unique and proprietary drug discovery uh, platform. For example, in high throughput screening uh, service, we can use 1.5 million compound library with high drug likeness score. Uh, we have experienced 700 high throughput screening campaign with uh, nine, over 90% hit rate. Uh, the details of HCS service will be talked by uh, Tomohiro after my talk. The most unique point is uh, uh, we can access to large uh, legacy data of 700 Takeda drug discovery projects. Based on these uh, values, we can provide solutions against customers' issues in their drug discovery research. <clears throat> uh, as shown here, we have all uh, functions for drug discovery research, such as high service screening, Medicam, assay development, animal disease model supply, in vitro and in vivo evaluation and DMPK and safety. These functions cover all stages for drug discovery, mainly before the clinical stage, as shown here. In addition, we have many strategic partners for new technologies, such as IPS cells, AI, and so on, and strong relationships with Japanese government and bioindustries. Bio Okay, uh, after my talk, Tomohiro and Takaharu will talk about our company, uh, uh, our capability. Today, uh, they will focus on high throughput screening and post uh, HCS activities. Please start, uh, uh, Tomohiro, please uh, uh, make a presentation for the high throughput screening service. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's start. Thank you all for attending this webinar. I'm Tomohiro Kamato, Senior Director of Discovery Biology Group at Axlead. Heat finding process, providing the starting point, is the most important to succeed in drug discovery. Today, I would like to talk about the reason why Axlead can successfully find high quality heat compounds, enabling rapid drug discovery. This is the outline for today's presentation. Firstly, I would like to talk about success factors for heat identification. Oh, these are success factors for heat identification. Acid has large scale libraries, cutting edge facilities, broad range of assay platforms, and well experienced researchers. Especially, effective collaboration between biologists and uh, chemists uh, is essential to discover high quality heat compounds. Acid has all factors enabling heat identification. ACID can provide comprehensive HTS services to an integrated HTS platform. ACID small molecule collection contains over 1.5 million compounds. This is the quality of a library. QED is an indicator of lead likeness. 90% of compounds have lead likeness property. 6% compounds were originally designed and synthesized. The features of a library are lead likeness and diversity. These are library sets for HTS. We have two types of libraries, diversity libraries and forecast libraries. Single library consists of 126,000 compounds. Full library consists of 500,000 compounds. It contains 10 different compounds per one sample. It will enable us to do large scale edge tests efficiently. We have multiple forecast libraries. In addition, uh, we can construct a forecast library selected from 1.5 million compounds library by virtual screen using in silico technology. This is a schema of axial libraries covering various targets. For example, for low reliable targets such as PPI targets, we recommend applying not only diversity libraries, but also extend rural five library and covalent compounds library. For new modalities, we establish forecast library for RNA targeted drugs and protein degraders. For phenotypic screening, biological annotation library is useful for mode of action analysis and screening uh, of 
combination drugs. So we can arrange the optimal library states according to the targets. This is the heat identification process in Axelib. It contains multiple steps to discover high quality heat compounds. It contains strategy planning, assay development, primary HTS, including pilot screen, a counter assay to exclude false positives, and heat selection. After that, uh, we can provide both heat expansion and profile in the post HTS prior to the lead generation. Uh, it is useful for making a lead generation plan and a prioritization of the heat chemotypes. So acid can offer high quality heat compounds with sophisticated strategy. This is track record of HTS campaigns. We have successfully completed around 700 HTS campaigns for various target classes with high heat rates. We have historical data about all programs. Based on our of experience, we can provide the best strategy and solution. This is our strength in the HTS platform. These are facilities. We have state of the art equipment compatible with diverse assets, fully automated screen system, acoustic liquid handling system, electrofacial scar screen system, high suit mass specs, and the dual artificial system, and high content assay, and so on. So, our facilities cover a broad range of assay systems. In addition, uh, we can perform HTS under biosafety level two condition, so we can use IPS cells and primary cells for HTS. These are assay platforms. They include GPCRs, ion channels, transporters, enzymes, nuclear receptors, protein protein interaction targets, and nucleic acids. So, our assay platforms wide range of target classes. This is the GPCR platform. We have experiments with these assays for HDS campaigns targeting GPCRs. Right here shows the actual example of HDS campaign to discover GPR39 positive arsenic modulators. We develop a system to monitor secret MP with a fresh system and conducted the HDS campaign with a library. Almost all heat compounds activated all signalings. However, this compound selectively activated GS signal. This is a GS biased ligand. So we can drive discovery of GB shell biased ligand with a platform. A rapid fire system enables us to conduct level free assay by directly monitoring substrate and products. This is an actual example of discovery of LDHB inhibitors using rapid fire mass system. LDHB is a lactose dehydrogenase. We detected both NADH and NAD with a rapid fire mass system and conducted a HS campaign with a library. Finally, we found heat compounds. This is a representative heat compound. This is the first selective inhibitor of LDHB. We clarified the binding mode with X-ray crystallography. This compound bound to the l site on LTHB. So we can drive discovery of enzyme inhibitors using rapid fire mass system. Here we have a capabilities on in vitro assays for profiling uh, biochemical assays and the mode of action analysis, kinetics, and cell-based assay to evaluate target engagement the cellular function and a biophysical analysis for target compound interaction assay, SPR and affinity selection mass spectrometry, and so on. And structural biologists can clarify the binding mode with X-ray crystallography. So we can drive the structure-based drug discovery using various technology from heat compounds. Moving on, I'd like to approach the dragging unknown targets. This is a track record of phenotypic screen. We have successfully achieved more than 76 campaign with phenotypic screen. This pie chart and table showed assay methods and usual screen library size. Our assay platform covers broad range of assay methods. Based on our of experience, we can propose the best screen strategy and solution according to your needs. We have a partnership with Fujifilm Cellular Dynamics, FCDI. They can provide IPS differentiated cell. 
This is actually an example of phenotypic screening using IPS cells. We develop a system to monitor the fluorescence labeled A beta uptake using iCell microglia cells. The uptake activity in trying to mutant microglia cells is decreased compared with the wild type. So we conducted this campaign to discover activators of phagocytosis using microglia cells. Finally, we found heat compounds. This is a representative heat compound. This compound activated a beta uptake in trying to mutant microglia cells selectively. We are now investigating the mechanism of action for heat compounds so we can drive phenotypic screening using IPS cells. Here we have a capabilities on target deconvolution. There are three strategies, annotation analysis for heat compounds, chemical proteomics for direct target fishing using the bait probe, and fingerprinting based on the NGS data analysis. So we can provide a comprehensive services about target deconvolution and support dragging unknown targets. Using high quality and attractive libraries, cutting edge facilities, and comprehensive assay platform, we can try a phenotypic drug discovery for heat read finding, drug repositioning, and target discovery. Next, I would like to talk about solution for dragging undraggable targets. There is a world trend towards new modalities such as target protein degraders and RN targeted drugs. These new modalities shed light on small molecule drug discovery, the potential targets for small molecules have been expanding. So we have constructed platforms for new modalities. These are solutions for targeted protein degradation. We constructed a molecular glue library consisting of 6,000 compounds. We have experience with these assays for HTS. As a cell-based assay, we develop a system using target high knocking cells. The target protein fused with a high bit tag is detected by a luminescence assay system from Promere. This is a robust high throughput system to monitor endogenous expression of targets. As a cell-free assay, we constructed a system to monitor carnally complex formation uh, with press system and binding assay like ligand competition and ASMS to discover ligase binders or POI binders. These platforms have a great complement to discover target protein degraders. Actually, we have a track record about 16 programs for target protein degradation. After that, we can provide comprehensive services of profile biophysics, cell-based assay, and global proteomics. These are our solution for RNA targeted drugs. We constructed focus libraries, general RNA focus library, and RNA splicing modulator libraries. We constructed this campaign, uh, and uh, we have experience with these assays for HTS, RNA, RNA BP binding, process probe binding, ASMS, and cell-based reportaging assay. Artificial phenotypic screen. After that, we can provide multiple profilings, biophysics, cell based assay, and energy data analysis. This is actually an example of discovery RNA binders with high throughput ASMS affinity selection mass spec. This is a biophysical screen. It enables us to conduct HTS for targets not amenable to traditional biochemical screen. We conduct HTS campaign for FM rival switch RNA binders. Finally, we found heat compounds from diversity library and RNA focused library. This compound is a representative compound. Uh, this compound bound to the FMA labs HRNA with a KD value of 65 nanomole. These compounds were completed with its natural ligand FMA. We clarified the binding mode with X-ray crystallography for small molecule. Actually, we have a track record about 15 programs for RNA targeted drugs so we can drive discovery of RNA targeted drugs with our platform. I would have summarized the points so far. We have three strengths. Firstly, we have farm origin attractive library. Secondly, we have state-of-the-art infrastructures, including fully automated screen system. Finally, we can find and we can provide high quality and comprehensive services in heat identification, including strategy planning, assay development, HDS profile, and heat expansion, led by medicinal chemists and uh, 
high throughput asymptotic profile. So uh, we can pro we can rapidly offer high quality hit and read compounds through an integrated platform. Next speaker is Dr. Hirayama, a head of chemistry. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Takahiro Hirayama, head of chemistry of uh, Axory. For the next slide, I'd like to talk about our post HDS strategy. In many cases, HDS hit compounds uh, present several challenges, such as insufficient potency and information for judgment, limited uh, uh, chemtech number, and also difficult prioritization. In order to uh, solve these challenges after HTS campaign, we strongly uh, propose post HTS process. And uh, finally, find advanced heat compounds with enhanced potency and uh, uh, extensive information. Post HTS consists of two main processes with our uh, for future described here. First uh, process is related compound assay. For this assay, related compound of heat are selected from our uh, compound library by mechanical research and medicinal chemist aspect to expand reference error. The second process is new chemical synthesis by medicinal chemist with our parallel synthesis technology and assay for initial study, including admin talks. In many cases, uh, we also conduct scaffold, uh, scaffold hopping to find more potent scaffold. Through uh, this entire process, we can uh, certainly expand and prioritize heat chem types uh, based on uh, their actual pros and cons, leading to select the uh, most promising chem type for uh, lead generation. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce our high throughput power synthesis technology. By using this platform, about 100 compounds can be rapidly synthesized within five to 10 days. But uh, this is a list of the uh, reactions that we can apply. Not only the reaction listed here, but also other reactions and the multi-step reaction are also available. In addition to the power synthesis, uh, we can also screen the uh, reaction condition, which can provide rapidly uh, the optimal condition for each reaction. Uh, out of 48 uh, conditions within 48 hours. Recently, we have established a new system that guides our expansion of heat compounds based on the parallel synthesis technology. We call it the farming system, which stands for fast accessible library and rapid modifying system. We have about 40,000 reagent sets. Half of them are originally synthesized building blocks, not commercially available. By crossing these building blocks in stock, we have designed a virtual compound library of over two very own compounds that can be synthesized immediately of this process can automatically replace the specific moiety of molecule into an appropriate building block based on similarity of structure and uh, physical chemical property, resulting in generation of various molecules different from the original heat content. To furthermore accelerate the DMTS cycle, we often use other proprietary in sql tools we call a code by effectively uh, using self developed tools uh, we can increase the finding efficiency for advanced compound uh, this multi dimensional approach including virtual screening uh, is particularly needed uh, for dragging and drag up target Uh, finally, I'd like to summarize my presentation of the obvious differ differentiation point from other CLOs. We have enormous drag-like compounds and building blocks in our library. The number is about 1.5 million. A large amount of legacy drag discovery data, including target-related and other talks data. 
uh, derived from pharmaceutical company. We can fully access and utilize uh, these assets internally for your research to solve any issues. In addition, we have self-developed uh, in tools, a code, and rapid and high throughput power synthesis technology. Our post HDS is designed to accelerate your heat discovery to identify advanced heat compound. So we strongly believe that uh, our post HDS strategy and find advanced heat compounds make your lead generation and optimization studies successful. Uh, that's all our uh, presentation. Uh, please contact to us if you are interested in our rapid heat discovery service. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, the QA session will be at the end of the uh, webinar. So please feel free to post your question in the uh, chat window. Thank you again. Thank you, Takaro-san. Um, this was very good. Um, and I'm going to take up the last part of our webinar, um, sharing my screen. So I'm going to talk about now the, the next phase of our webinar, how can we further accelerate the drug discovery from the HIT to the clinics and how CNGN is um, helping our uh, multiple partners in expediting their research in a very collaborative and integrated model. So just to give you a brief background about CNGN, those who um, in the audience and the participants who don't know about CNGN, CNGN is a global CRO CDMO. Uh, we provide end-to-end uh, -end services uh, in the drug discovery, development, and manufacturing, and we are into the existence for more than 26 years as of now. Uh, we are working across the, the, the spectrum of the different uh, modalities, right from the small and the large molecules, antibodies included, ADCs, oligonucleotides, and protags, with a market cap of $3 billion. What we are currently working is, I think, is mainly, uh, and uh, you know, in our existence and our Success lies with the trust from the clients. I think this is the one thing that we we value a lot in our collaborations and partnership uh, to deliver the different types of the clinical candidates and taking the compounds forward for any development purpose. Uh, we are based out of um, uh, based out of India as of now, and we have the presence in three different sites in India: uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, as well as Mangalore. Mangalore is mainly for the manufacturing plants. Um, I think the key advantage is that we have the different types of the uh, all the end-to-end -end services, like I mentioned, and we have the extensive experience in providing the solution to the different uh, levels of the complex scientific problems. Uh, and we have the proven track record um, at scaling of the strategic partnerships. We have the partnerships starting from the uh, from the one uh, very very small work with the one FTS to to more than 100 FTS. Uh, and this is a very flexible business model with um, uh, cost-effective operations and the uh, labor arbitrage. Uh, we we provide the IP to our clients, so it's a pure place CRO. So we don't have we don't own uh, own the IP, and we don't have any of the internal programs also where there is any kind of a conflict of interest. Uh, as I mentioned, we are differentiating here as an integrated provider for the discovery, development, and manufacturing services across um, uh, the different levels and to end both in the small and the large molecules. So we are working uh, uh, into the different areas. We started our journey starting with the small molecules, added the peptides slowly over there. Small molecules still uh, stay, uh, they, they are the mainstay of the drug modality what we are working on. Um, around um, uh, eight years back, we started pouring into the antibodies space. We started developing like the tool antibodies, the reagent, some of the other reagent purpose before we uh, moved into the therapeutic antibody space. And now currently we are working with the oligonucleotides, the antibody drug conjugates, uh, the target protein modulators, particularly with the protax. And we are also working with uh, the other mechanisms of the degradations, uh, like the otax, which is the autophagy uh, degradation. And then, of course, we are working with the cell therapies like mainly the CAR-D space as well as the iPSAs for the screening purpose. So I'm just going to switch over here, the, the gear actually, and just to understand that, you know, how the drug discovery continuum is happening. And I think the drug discovery continuum is a very 
quite expensive, the long term and the high risk affair. And as you can see into this kind of a flow diagram that uh, the cycle time is pretty long actually, you know, for a drug to, you know, right from the, uh, the, the concept stage uh, from the targeted validation before it goes uh, into the market. Uh, and then the probability of the success is fairly low uh, for the different stages. So we start like, you know, actually mentioned with the target validation and followed by the compound screening. And this thing can be, uh, is done by the HTS is one of the main technologies which basically conducts this particular thing uh, before the compounds move forward into the different stages of the lead generations and lead optimizations with the SAR optimization by the medicinal chemist. Uh, and the properties, different PKPD properties of the, of the compounds and before it goes into the clinics. But I think the, the learnings uh, as of now from in this uh, drug discovery process for, for more than, um, uh, I would say, uh, the uh, 670 ads is like the average time for a compound moving from target to market is, uh, is 12 to 15 years. And the average cost for a new drug to be developed for the clinical use lies somewhere closer to the $2.6 billion. It's a pretty high towering cost. And uh, I think this is this is compounded by the by the the failure rate that nearly nine out of the ten drug candidates after they enter the clinical studies they fail because of one reason or other reason during the phase one, phase two, or the phase three clinical trials, or before the drug approvals for the multiple uh, different reasons. I think the different reasons that you know uh, why ninety percent of our drugs they fail in the clinics. The major reason lies in the lack of clinical efficacy nearly 40 to 50 percent of the drugs they um they they they, they do not you know, have the adequate clinical efficacy to move forward uh and the second thing is uh, it is plagued by sometimes the very undefined or unmanageable uh, manageable toxicity and the safety liabilities and that results into the poor efficacy to the safety ratio so nearly 30 percent of the drugs are failing because of these reasons because of safety and the uh and the and the compliance the patient compliance issues uh, there are nearly 10 to 15 drugs which fail because of the poor drug-like properties, like mainly the, the pharmacokinetic or the pharmacodynamic properties. Um, and then there are certain reasons beyond the, some of the technical reasons, and these are also some important factors. For example, the changing market, the lack of the commercial needs, the patent life of the drug, you know, uh, before it goes into the market launch. Uh, these are the factors which are the driving factors. And uh, of course, the poor strategic planning, like, you know, when there is a change in the focus in the portfolio, and suddenly uh, the, the programs, uh, they are prematurely, they are terminated. So, uh, so this is a sobbing story of the, the drug discovery, and not on the uh, beyond that. You know, the question here is even in terms of the timelines. Uh, I think the serious question is we have seen during the COVID time that the vaccines they were delivered in under a year, almost like uh, in 12 to 18 months. We saw the uh, the discovery of many of the COVID-19 vaccines, and I think the question here, which is, which is very legitimate question, is to ask. Why does it normally take a decade or more to discover and develop the new medicines? You know, because our timelines are really like you know almost like uh, 10, to, 10 to 12 years and above. So I think the one of the question, uh, one of the uh, uh, question, and you know what we are, I'm going to focus actually today is that you know why there is a lack of clinical efficacy under the first two points, and second thing is what's the safety liability, and how these things they can be uh, understood early on. Uh, and of course, uh, when I say about the poor drug-like properties, um, there's nearly threefold improvement since 1990s. You know, uh, if you see that time, the understanding about the uh, about the phase one uh, and the phase two, you know, the the PK properties of the drug actually, or the from the preclinical species to the to the human translation of the PK, uh, that was in the infancy as compared to what we see now. There are multiple models which are helping. Uh, in, in, in improving the drug-like properties early on in the preclinical space. So there is a, a dramatic improvement, but still the efficacy, clinical efficacy, and the safety, they remain of paramount importance. So, um, uh, so as you can see onto this, uh, this picture that uh, the initial stages when the compounds are into the lead optimization, a lot of the candidates say, or the molecules that fail, they exit because of the poor PKPD or the safety and toxicity. And then in the when they enter into the phase one, uh, the major issue is the poor tolerability. Nearly 40% of the compounds they fail over there. And uh, and then the poor PK uh, in this particular stage to the translating to the human. Uh, and uh, 
out of these compounds, what are the molecules they enter from the phase one to phase two? Uh, we see nearly 40 to 50 percent drugs again failing in this particular stage because of the poor efficacy. And subsequently, again, the number is lies close to the 50 percent only. And the reasons are because of the efficacy or the safety, if not the, uh, the market factors or other driving factors. So uh, it, it goes back, it takes us back actually into some of the early stages of the drug discovery. Uh, and I think it puts some uh, critical questions here uh, to be answered. Uh, uh, whether the what's the level of the target selection is, is it really, are we confident about the target selection? Uh, the second thing is, uh, have we, if you have identified the right target, is the validation adequate or not? Uh, I think that that's a question and what's the approaches which have been used to validate the target. And very important thing is most of the drugs are failing when they uh, when they go into the animals to the humans. So uh, this is a gray area right now because of the translatability of the animal efficacy to the human efficacy. And I think there are multiple questions over there and the different approaches which are emerging, which can help into the drug discovery. Uh, and the very important point here is uh, uh, from in terms of the drug exposure. And so far, we uh, the trend has been to look the drug exposure into the uh, into into some of the target tissues uh, or into the plasma mainly, and using that particular concentration of Cmax values and the other pharmacokinetic parameters uh, from the different species, and doing the allometric scaling to predict the human dose. Uh, the, the the trends are emerging where the drug exposure into the disease target tissues versus the healthy uh, tissues they are very important. So definitely, the preclinical studies. Uh, this is the new. Um, it is very important thing that uh, any of the disease target tissue should have what is our drug exposure over there as compared to the healthy ones. And of course, like you know, uh, anything for the early safety predictors, what are those? Um, uh, the whether it is through the selectivity or it is because of some uh, other reasons, what can be predicted early on. So, what are the current approaches and uh, and the trends uh, or, or the technologies and the trends which are emerging to speed up the drug discovery and the development? Uh, so, so here are the some of the things. Uh, for example, the machine learning and the artificial intelligence, particularly the AI, is helping a lot. It is driving the uh, the, the science and trying to cut down the the cost as well as um, speeding up the drug discovery process. Uh, it is very helpful into the target identification space, the drug repurposing, uh, managing the DMTA cycle, which is a design, manifest, uh, design make, uh, test, and analyze. Uh, and of course, into the HDS, into the virtual screening, the structure based screening, uh, the phenotypic high content imaging based approaches. Um, and, and of course, uh, from the patient data or whatever is the clinical data uh, from the different trials which is existing. So, machine learning has multi dimensions and it is helping a lot in cutting down the some, some of the timelines as well as uh, as well as the cost the second thing is the digitization and the automation um, of the processes um, as compared to a lot of the manual process and when i say this thing this is this is not only applicable to the um, to the to the scientific components but there are many components uh, which are beyond science which are like the logistics and, and and other areas and how that digitization is helping in those in those components also then, uh, importantly, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the strong translational sciences, uh, and particularly, like I said, the screening into the cells from the healthy versus the disease subjects. I, this is something extremely important area, uh, and and a lot of the bio banks, you know, from where if we get the right uh, uh, right uh, uh, the samples uh, from the disease subjects, uh, depending on the biopsies, and uh, uh, you know, so that that that's going to help a lot. Uh, the second thing is the use of the IPSC is the normal versus the mutants. If these can be genetically engineered, uh, they, they are they are helping a lot in the early understanding for the translation of the efficacy from the preclinical stage to the clinical stage. Um, and uh, the human age mice, this is these are the other ones which are which are paving the way in this particular area, and they can cut down the failure rate. Uh, and of course, like I mentioned, the drug exposure in the disease target tissues versus the normal healthy tissues, um, and comparing it with the free versus the bound plasma drug concentration, not only going with the free drug concentrations. The other technologies which are uh, which are which have emerged and which have made a lot of the uh, uh, lot of the mark actually in, uh, in recently is uh, some of the translational technologies like lab on chips and the organoids. And uh, the, these are also, uh, they're quite high throughput and they're also quite helping. 
the new drug modalities, uh, of course, with the better specificity and possibly the better safety margins. Uh, it is too early to say about the safety margins for these new uh, new modalities on the horizons. But uh, yes, given the, their specificity, we can understand that uh, they might provide they might provide some better efficacy to the safety index, like the target targeted protein degrader, uh, the RNA modulators, and the oligonucleotides. Uh, and then, of course, there are some ways. Like many of the companies, they are taking this uh, this approach, like going and uh, looking for the new indications where there is a, for example, something like a rare genetic diseases with the unmet medical needs, and where there is a fast follower approvals are given for the uh, for the clinical trials. Uh, then, then from the formulation side and from the delivery standpoint, it's the target organ drug delivery methods often. Many drugs failure failure is because that the drug is not reaching to the target organs, and and it is not because that the drug is the molecule was bad. I think it is because the molecule was not delivered rightfully to the right target organ, and 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 that's the reason I, it, it it failed into the clinical trials because of the poor efficacy. So there is a need to identify the best of the delivery methods which are which have been worked out in the past, and they are also currently a lot of the science is uh, unfolding in these areas. And then, of course, the innovative study design to the regulatory partnerships. A lot of the companies uh, they are they are doing these kind of things for the early uh, engaging the regulatory bodies to design the uh, some some of these kind of designs for the clinical trials. And of course, like I said, the fast logistics actually the world is moving at a fast pace, and uh, and the and a lot of the time goes into the uh, in setting up the shipments and and setting up the uh, uh, the, the logistics. So. I think there is a fast turnaround time which is also needed, and the digitization of many of these components is also helping to drive the drug discovery forward. So, like I said on the previous slide, a lot of the the AI is a rising wave um, in the drug discovery. Um, this is already like uh, the, the uh, it is expanding at an annual rate of almost like 40%. And a lot of the companies, they, they are already working in this particular uh, uh, area and they're taking the compounds at the different stages of the discovery. Uh, and not only the discovery, but there are, you know, almost like five, uh, 15 plus compounds. They are already in the clinical trials. And there are nearly 150 small molecules drugs in the discovery, uh, which are as of now the data is still 2021, but the number is, is increasing. And there is an increasing investment in this uh, in this area, and this is this is reaching almost like five billion dollars by the end of 2021, and the numbers are uh, quite promising in the coming years. The how the scope of the AI it is not like it is it is lying beyond the conventional targets, so it is not limiting to the to the conventional target classes. For example, if you see here, this is from Nature Reduced Drug Discovery. A lot of the AI companies they are working on the kinases, non-kinases, GPCRs, and the uh, and the classical targets. Uh, and in the conventional areas like the oncology uh, is a, is the main area, mainstay for the AI also, uh, because there is a high need in the oncology for and, and there are different types of the cancer. So so AI plays is playing a very big role over there. Um, as any other top pharma company, their focus is mainly the oncology. But nonetheless, it's coming in a big manner into the central nervous system, CNS area portfolio, as well as in immunology or in anti-infectives also. So, uh, but but this is not limiting to to the conventional target classes because there are some lot of the AI derived compounds for the novel targets like the SHP2 or the DNA helicases or the MALT1. These are already going into the first in the human uh, trial studies and the IND applications. They are also uh, initiated. So uh, the so definitely AI has a potential to inform whether a drug is going to successfully engage an intended target like the cancer related protein, for example, or whether a candidate drug is going to bind to the uh, to the unintended targets in the body, and that's going to decide about the undesirable side effects or the safety index for for the patient. So I think. A lot of this knowledge can be can be harnessed early on. Uh, it is the AI is helping in understanding of the target and, like I said, the safety index early on, and it's helping both in biology as well as in the chemistry. In biology, finding the right biological targets uh, through the omics data, through the uh, biomarker data, through uh, any any of the uh, experimental like the high content imaging data from the phenotypic screening understanding the protein interactions uh, on uh, using the crystal structures and the other uh, and of course uh, of course on the durability of the protein structure predictions also uh, on the chemistry side this is helping a lot in identifying and designing the small molecules for the preclinical candidates and 
uh, how AI is helping to explore the effects and chemical space in the targets, um, and, and and how the the AI analysis uh, is is helping using the molecular structure like the protein structure, uh, and then using the experimental data to predict the the sort of the SAR early on, uh, and generating the lead like small molecules which can be which can be brought out. So. Um, so a lot of the important properties of the AI is, is overall helping in terms of detecting the pharmacokinetic and the pharmacodynamic properties also across the different species, how the compounds are, are, are moving uh, uh, from the one stage to another stage and how they're going to translate finally in terms of the, the, the PK and the PD and the efficacy properties uh, from the preclinical species to, to the humans. Now, uh, I, we, we call it like, you know, whether uh, the question here is whether the AI is going to replace a complete thing like the, uh, I, I think the answer is no, but definitely one of the greatest hopes for the AI enabled drug discovery is how AI can accelerate the drug discovery timelines through the rapid target identification and the validation. And of course, how it can cut down the time, uh, which is going into the molecular design and the optimization and in a classical, like as a DMP cycle. So this is a, this is going to be like as a combined approach of the the, the, the robotics and the humans uh, AI. This is going to going to work out together. This is something like what PharmaTech published recently, and this is a case study from Estilas, uh, how they have used uh, the different tools uh, of the AI and the digitization, particularly to to manage the DMT cycle. And, and 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 like I say, this is this is going to be like as a mix of mind and the machine ultimately when it comes for the DMT cycle. Uh, and and AI is is one component out of that just to expedite the the discovery process. The 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 other technology that you mentioned in the beginning, this is this is mainly like the three D bioprinting, uh, which is which is also coming up in a big manner to improve the efficiency and the sustainability in the drug discovery. Uh, the, the current challenge is what we are working with a lot of the cell-based assays. These are the 2D cell culture models. Now, these models, we understand, they fail to mimic the intrinsic properties of the in vivo tissues, physiological systems, because they lack tissue-specific environments. For example, the microenvironment in the tumors, particularly the hypoxic conditions, they are very important. And, and, and uh, the absence of such kind of environment can predict the uh, wrongly any data. So. Uh, so, and, and the second thing is, the, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, that there is a uh, the translation of the animal efficacy to the human clinical trials that is that is still questionable for many indications. In many indications, like you know, in in oncology or in some other areas, maybe we have the better translation, but it may not be in the Parkinson's and Alzheimer. We don't have the best of the translations right now. So, how the 3D bioprinting is helping? I think 3D bioprinting is is trying to cut down this kind of a timeline. Uh, by by using a lot of the organoids as well as the spheroid models early on, and this has been already employ, employed for the uh, small molecule vaccines and for the different therapeutics. So so these models are um, and they they generally they are the HTS compatible. They use the patient derived cells, and I think that's the advantage. And since they 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 use the um, is a co culture system, so which is a right. Uh, 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 right environment for the uh, or right suitable physiological environment, uh, which carries the uh, the proper extracellular matrix component, which are important for the cell growth and maintaining the phenotypic functionality. Uh, so, so that is how this system works. And then, of course, it can reduce the cost and reduce the, uh, the animals. Uh, and uh, as the as the things uh, move forward uh, in the preclinical to the clinical translation. Uh, the 3D bioprinting is also coming very handy for the advanced delivery systems, uh, particularly the cell therapies where the cell has to be delivered to the to the uh, to the right tar target organ, for example. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the other uh, the new uh, uh, discoveries, particularly in the biofabrications, uh, they are going to be very helpful. And this is using the DNA RNA and the protein engineering together, putting it together so that you know there is a specificity of the some of these. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the tools in, in the clinic. The the other thing I mentioned about the organ and the chip actually, this is the microfluidic devices which are also helping a lot. And this is a very promising technique for all of the initial screening and the, the medi medicines because uh, this is like the diffuse chambers and uh, this is also bridging a gap between the animal studies and the clinical trials which are involving the animal studies. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, Synthin is working across a different component, uh, right, right from the informatics to the safety talks and further to, into the development. 
we have the expertise uh, uh, currently into the different modalities and of course we are working with the different indications like the oncology and the immuno-oncology they are the mainstay of focus with the cns autoimmune metabolic disorders and, and the rare disorders this is just like a snapshot what we have worked so far in the small molecule and the uh, at the large molecules and something which is falling in between for the different indications for our client projects. So I mentioned about the DMTA. We are working a lot onto the lean stigma to improve the processes to uh, uh, you know to to for the speed as well as the from the quality uh, purpose. Uh, so we have employed this DMTA cycle for for our chemistry synthesis as well as using it to the screening, uh, uh, initial screening, which is basically the primary screening as well as for the ADME assays. And we are using a lot of the automated uh, systems, including the automated compound management, high content screening, 3D spheroids, what I mentioned in the previous slide, and some of the organoids and the, uh, the emerging technologies also, which are we, we are using in this particular space uh, to, to uh, do the lead optimization stages. And I mentioned about the logistics team. So, so Syngin provides like uh, uh, is a dedicated team of the uh, supply chain experts. We deal with all the kind of a consignments across the globe currently, uh, which means even to uh, uh, and and getting the biological material. I think this is one of the concerns that many many of the people they have that to to get the materials to India. And I think there is no concern about that because this is something what we are managing uh, routinely and very consistently without any kind of a uh, problems over there. Uh, overall discovery. Uh, uh, chemistry capabilities. We are working across uh, in the all that space uh, of the synthetic chemistry, library synthesis, uh, the peptides and the medicinal chemistry, and of course on the ADCs also and toxins. Likewise, in the biology space, we are dealing end to end in the different components uh, of the assays uh, into the different formats. The ADME and the PK in biopharmacology. We have the different types of disease models and the target engagement models and the protein science and antibody discovery and cell engineering also. Uh, these are the, some of the screening continuum. Uh, we like uh, Exilid uh, supports uh, in our partnership for the HTS, and then we perform a lot of the primary screening here, followed by a lot of the functional assays development and taking the compounds forward from the PKPD to the efficacy of the disease models. Some of the slides that what we have done in terms of the targeted validations, uh, using the SIRNAs as well as the CRISPR-Cas, talents, and different types of approaches, what we uh, we are using for the initial target validations. Uh, we are using the, a lot of the platforms like the IncuSites is the workhorse platform for a lot of our immunology as well as the oncology studies, uh, where we are we are we are doing the co-culturing of the cells, and uh, this is a very high throughput system and a very fast system for the live cell imaging of the cells, how the response to cell killing is happening, for example, in the oncology systems. So we use the spheroids a lot also for such kind of assays, like I mentioned, just to give a right tumor microenvironment to the uh, to the spheroids and then testing the drugs over there. Uh, we are working in the Prodex also uh, extensively, uh, and we have developed and established a lot of the models uh, for the from the biology standpoint as well as a lot of the models into the uh, to have the early understanding about the PKPD before we take them for the animal efficacy studies. The in-cell question is one technology, uh, one platform that we, which is helping us a lot in, in the selection of the degraders. Uh, this is basically the four different laser-based technology where we are, we are, we are, we are testing the compounds, uh, uh, you know, for the, for the different wavelengths of the uh, secondary antibodies, and we can multiplex them. And we can use these compounds for the initial testing. This is one example for the uh, PKPD correlations. Like I mentioned, this is for the, uh, or a degraded platform, what we have established internally, use taking a literature tool compound. This was published recently into the TPD conference last year uh, in Boston. And last but not the least, this is our capabilities in the IPC platform, where we have derived a lot of the cells, genetically engineered them using the CRISPR-Cas approaches, and finally differentiated the cells to the uh, the IPC cells to generate the allogenic CAR T cells. And now we are in the process of generating the, some other lineages uh, so that for the other applications. So finally, what I'm saying is that, uh, as you can see, there are the different uh, technologies in the horizon which are going to dominate the small molecular discovery uh, with the data automation and the digitalization of the platforms, which are going to help reduce the timelines and maybe to give an advantage over the cost. Uh, we have the advanced translation models for the reliable production of the clinical efficacy, the safety liabilities, 
same thing goes for the biomarkers for the target uh, engagement and then of course a lot of the new uh, tailor-made drugs the precision medicines the program in therapies asos mrna therapeutics they are going to drive in the uh, in, uh, in the next few years so this is open for the you know, the discussion and the next steps uh, sachin and yuka to you thank you very much well uh, <clears throat> thank you atul and thank you all the panelists for the insightful presentations uh, i guess we may we may have time for a couple of questions uh, uh, one question is hit rates higher than 90% in hts campaigns is very high what is the reason why your hts has been successful i guess tomohiro you may want to answer this yeah. okay uh, thank you for your question uh, mainly there are two reasons for this success firstly uh, we have high quality and diverse libraries uh, the diversity uh, ensure the successful uh, hit identification. Uh, we have purchased uh, compounds from more than 120 different vendors. Uh, so uh, diversity is so important. Uh, and uh, we are expanding library uh, according to the customer needs uh, drug discovery trend. Secondly, uh, we can provide uh, this strategy because uh, we have a, a great track record about 700 disease campaigns. It is useful for us to make the best uh, strategy. Uh, for example, uh, for different targets such as um, PPI targets, uh, we use PPI focus library. In addition, we can conduct virtual screening based on the crystal structure or chemical um, ligands uh, using in situ technologies. So the main reason uh, for this success is based on high, high quality library and strategy. So it is caused by effective collaboration between well experienced chemists and biologists. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, Atul, I think I, this is for you. What drugs are in the most advanced phases with your company's support? And what is your success rate in drug discovery using AI uh, analysis of data? Yeah, so uh, uh, that's that's a good question. So uh, I, I think I presented the chart actually. So currently we uh, we are successfully delivered the drugs which are into the phase one clinical trials and phase two basically some uh, a couple of drugs which are entering into the phase two clinical trial. That's our success rate actually in that particular thing. A lot of the targets are there where we are into the different stages of the uh, of the drug discovery uh, prog uh, programs. Uh, what component actually the AI is driving? The, the second part of the question is I am saying that like we are seeing we are working currently with uh, um, at least five plus partners who are for the hardcore AI based organizations and we have uh, nearly uh, I would say more than 20% of our portfolio is 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 driven by the AI uh, identified targets. We are working with them. Okay, thank you, Atul. I think uh, we are uh, come to the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. And uh, Atul, I'll pass it over to you again for any closing remarks, uh, Atul or Kazu, uh, any of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. Uh, uh, I, I really appreciate everyone, everyone's time. I hope this, this in, uh, webinar was informative. So thank you very much for joining, Kazu. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, us. Uh, 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 this is a very uh, great, great opportunity for us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank uh, you. Bye. Thank you so much.